the old building again. I'm going to talk today about the uh, healthy microbiome and rather than kind of rehashing a lot of what you probably already know, uh, I'm going to pose and try and answer the question of on the basis of a few years worth of study at this stage, are we any closer to defining what the healthy microbiome is and what the implications, what are the implications of that? Uh, before I start I'll put the acknowledgements uh, up front. Um, I'd like to thank especially um, colleagues here, our former colleagues here at, at CSIRO where a lot of this work was initiated and also colleagues at the University of Queensland where this work is, uh, is continuing. Uh, we've ha also had a, a, a quite a broad range of collaborations over the years so from my perspective most notably with um, scientists and researchers at INRA and at the uh, Craig Venture Institute um, but I'll also be describing work um, carried out by other members of the group uh, who work at these other institutions here. So, I think one of the most interesting uh, developments uh, from my perspective over the last few years has been the um, introduction into the, uh, amongst the, the general public of the concept of the uh, microbiota. If you tell people, what do you do? You're a scientist, oh, okay, a bit intimidated. What do you work on? The gut microbiota. Suddenly, there's a recognition there that I think five, ten years ago it wasn't there people are now aware of the microbiota as a concept uh, and also know a little bit about it so they can ask you um, I think quite um, intelligent questions and ones that uh, in many cases are worthy of consideration and make us really evaluate ourselves as scientists if what we're doing is relevant to the general public. But tracing this back is, you know, is a little bit interesting. When did this really begin to happen? Uh, I trace it back to kind of the mid Noughties. So following the publication of the, the human genome in 2003, uh, I think a lot of people were surprised at the time that we were only detecting or identifying around uh, 23,000 genes in the human genome. Um, and although subsequently we were able to link uh, many <coughs> genetic variations to a, a range of disease, they were not sufficient in many cases to explain the cause of disease. Uh, as that decade developed, I think there was a, a greater appreciation that we were missing a whole component there, uh, and this case was the, um, the gut microbiota in many cases, or the, the human microbiome in, in general. And in 2006, the uh, Human Microbiome Project was launched to try and answer or look at that other hidden aspect uh, of our genetic inheritance. So let's kind of put this in a little bit of context. If we first of all start off by defining what is a human, well, in many cases, most people would say, well, it's me, myself, my genes, that's it. But that's not um, the whole uh, truth. We are associated with a very uh, broad and diverse array of microbes that colonize us from very early in our lives. Um, we are, as an example, um, our human cells are dominated by an order of magnitude by microbial cells, so tenfold. Moving beyond that, if we look at the uh, human hologenome. So that combination of the host and its associated microbes, if we look at this, this is the human genome here, and this is the contribution of the microbial fraction of our genome to the overall hologenome. So the hologenome can be de defined basically uh, as the sum of host genes and then the associated um, really long-term microbial uh, symbionts. Um, and what that means, or the implications of that, is our genome itself is pretty fixed, but the microbial fraction is more uh, adaptable and potentially changeable, which confers upon us an advantage that we can, um, for example, readily adapt to different diets and so on um, by changing our um, uh, microbes. And potentially this confers an advantage to us in terms of our, of our evolution. Where does our microbiome come from, our microbiota? Well, what we really look at is um, very early on in our lives, past birth, um, we're colonized by microbes. 
Um, it used to be thought that we were born sterile, although more recent evidence suggests that we are actually now colonized by microbes uh, in utero and that the placenta itself is associated and has its own microbiome. Um, that's still open for discussion. But anyway, we do know that shortly after birth, we are colonized uh, during birth by bacteria from the um, mother's vaginal tract and then subsequently the mother transfers bacteria that translocate from her own gut into the bloodstream and onto her breast milk which she then passes on um, to her infant. Um, what's quite interesting about that is that many of the bacteria that are um, transferred during that process are bacteria and microbes that are specifically adapted to breaking down uh, milk proteins and the carbohydrates that are associated with milk. So what the mother is in effect doing is giving the nutrient and also giving the microbial inoculum that will allow the infant to maximize its energy recovery from that. Following on from that, really uh, post weaning onwards, what we see is very rapidly we see the, the um, development of what is to all intents and purposes a simplified adult microbiota. So the microbiota really changes in this area here from what is, a, for, for example, in, amongst the infant, uh, pre-weaned, dominated by lactobacilli, bifidobacteria, and so on, um, to as we move on here, we begin to see other bacteria begin to dominate and characterized by the dominance of the phylum firmicutes and the bacteroidetes. Generally, on into um, old age, we see that the uh, complexity and diversity of the microbiome continues to increase. Uh, we do see blips along the way. So, for example, most of us at some stage will have taken antibiotics and what you see as you take antibiotics that you see a dramatic reduction in diversity, but that rebounds pretty quickly again following antibiotics. And in general, we see this upward trajectory. So, how do we define this contribution to health? Well, very simply, I look at it as an inverted triangle. It's underpinned by host genetics, but as I mentioned, host genetics uh, are really fixed, can't, can't be altered. Um, and we know at this stage as well that host genetics may be ex can ex maybe explain our risk of disease, but they do not explain our development of disease at a later stage. So for example, we know with inflammatory bowel disease that it's characterized by at least over 150 uh, genetic susceptibilities, but we know that these are necessary but not sufficient to drive the onset of disease. And instead we have a number of other factors that impact that. So one is the gut microbiota. Um, so as an example, a great example of this is looking at monozygotic twins, where for ulcerative colitis there's a discordance rate of 80%, and for Crohn's disease where, is, where there is a discordance rate of 50%, identical twins you would expect raised in the same household, exposed to the same types of foods and so on. Um, so it's plausible that changes in the microbiota could explain that. Other things that affect um, our risk of disease. One is your environment. So for example, we know at this stage that if you're raised <coughs> with a pet, it reduces your risk of developing asthma. If you're raised on a farm, it reduces your risk of developing allergic diseases. Um, interestingly, interestingly, dogs have a better effect here than cats, for example. So dogs are protective as, or more protective as compared to cats. Um, another thing here is your lifestyle. So for example, how, well, how much you exercise, what you eat, all these have a knock-on effect. And overall, what it does is contribute to your overall risk of disease. When everything is in balance, the triangle stays upright. But changes, so for example, a combination of your genetic susceptibilities, maybe for example with bad lifestyle, um, an, an environment that's um, conducive to developing allergic diseases, um, inheriting your microbiome. So for example, some of the more interesting work is looking at microbial transfers, okay? So really in, in animal studies, but also I'll mention briefly later on some work in human studies where transferring the microbiota can also have a big impact on the phenotype of the host. Um, and we know, I've listed here at least four diseases where we know that the microbiota has a significant impact on your disease risk. So beyond the host genetics, the environment and lifestyle. So looking at the development, um, one thing that we do know is 
looking at the microbiome, the, the ecosystem of the um, holobiont, one of the things that's critical for us, the host, is that we want to protect against uh, disruption of the food webs. So the bacteria that basically break down most of the nutrients that we eat into products that we can then assimilate for growth. So ecological theory tells us that the host should select for bacteria that are um, unrelated or more distantly related, but that still have similar functions. Some of the more interesting recent work has, basic, has identified a number of genetic loci, and I'm just showing here in the mouse, where certain host genetic loci can control for the abundance of specific bacteria in the gut. And I'm looking here at the, the core gut microbiota. So in these mice, this was the um, fraction of bacteria that were present uh, across all of the mice. And we saw that there were individual host genotype effects on the abundance of this core microbiota. The core microbiota is pretty interesting. It's the fraction of, uh, it's the, really the most uh, abundant fraction. So it's characterized by a long tail. So for example, it might represent only 2% of the total microbial diversity in the gut, but they make up 30% of that community in terms of abundance. So they're very, very abundant. And we know by looking at them that, that they play a key role for us in terms of harvesting um, uh, energy from, from our diet uh, and in terms of immunomodulation and so on. Here, what I'm basically showing, looking at the lean and obese, we see that as expected, there is really a lot of variation at the phylum level, at least, in terms of the bacteria that predominate the gut. So we're seeing, moving across from individual, we're not seeing a similar pattern of colonization. However, when we look at the functional attributes, we see that it's pretty steady. So overall, while the communities may vary, the functional potential of that community seems to be pretty in steady state. In terms of the core microbiota, well, how do we define that? Um, as I mentioned earlier on, as we move into adulthood, um, the gut microbiota is dominated by two phyla. Um, so the firmicutes, uh, generally cla cla uh, classed as gram-positives, uh, and the bacteroidetes, which are generally classed as gram-negatives. We also see a smaller proportion of the actinobacteria, and here we see a lot of the bifidobacteria and so on that I mentioned earlier on um, that the mother passes on to her infant. Uh, in early life, the actinobacteria and the bifidobacteria really dominate in the gut, but as we develop into adulthood and our diet changes, we begin to see that the firmicutes and the bacteroidetes begin to take over. The firmicutes are basically broken down into two clusters, cluster 4 and cluster 14A, um, and the bacteroidetes as well, dominated by a B. vulgatus, bacteroides vulgatus cluster, and an allostipes type cluster, and bifidobacterium longum. <coughs> so in this study here, we're looking at the bacteria that were detected in at least 50% of healthy individuals, and we can um, set various um, cutoffs. So for example, some people would set 90, dropping it all the way to 50. But this is the core abundant bacteria that if you're a healthy adult, you can expect to have in your gut. Moving on to metagenomic sequencing, so as we were able to kind of with the development of, of next generation sequencing, get ever increasing depth. Um, we saw that this was, from this study, they identified a core of 64, extending that to a core of about 155 bacteria. And we can see, just looking at the core, that we see big differences in terms from the, the healthy versus the ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. So for example, the, um, we know that many of these bacteria are abundant in the healthy gut, um, but specific bacteria, so for example, um, Facilibacterium prasnitii, Ruminococcus bromii, are um, almost undetectable in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease gut. So this could be a definition or a starting point for, for identifying what is the healthy core microbiota, and a good starting point for maybe trying to exploit that to, for example, um, try and induce disease remission in people with inflammatory bowel diseases. Can we do that? Well, yes we can. There is a, a long history and a multi-million if not billion dollar worldwide industry um, looking at um, probiotics. Um, so directly introducing bacteria into your gut to generate beneficial effects, be they reduced inflammation or uh, increased capacity to um, break down different dietary substrates. 
Um, or we can take a more direct approach, which is using prebiotics, so feeding your bacteria. So be that um, feeding resistant starches or fibers or the um, things that we would typically be getting in a healthy diet, but in many cases people don't have the time, they want to go to the effort, and will just take specific prebiotics. So this can be done, okay? One of the problems, though, is that many of the probiotics, when you look at what they are, they're bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, lactococci. They are grass bacteria, so generally regarded as safe. They have a long history of use, for example, as starter cultures for making cheese and so on, for making yogurts, um, and it's generally accepted that they are safe to introduce into the host. Now, the bar has been set increasingly higher in terms of being able to call them probiotics. You need to show that there is a beneficial effect. But generally, these are not well adapted to surviving in the adult gut. So you need to take these regularly. And as soon as you stop taking your probiotic, we, we can see in um, some of the molecular analysis that we do that the abundance of these bacteria drops off really, really quickly because that's not their natural environment. They'd have a better chance in the infant gut, for example, where the diet is more conducive to keeping them at that high level. Um, prebiotics as well, again, work quite effectively in terms of increasing the abundance of key groups, but um, again, reducing your amount of, um, for example, fiber con uh, consumption can alter the uh, microbiota. Are there better probiotics we could use? So is there a next generation? Well, it turns out that there is, and you know, a great place to start, we think, is the, what we're looking at as the healthy microbiome. So that fraction of bacteria that we detect in pretty much all healthy people and that are there at high abundance. Has it been assessed? Well, again, yes, it has, and really, most notably, the greatest successes have been looking at Clostridium difficile infections. Um, these can be chronic infections, very, very difficult to treat. Spore formers, so very often what you'll find is if you treat the subject with um, antibiotics, you see disease remission. Stop the antibiotics, and what you see are the spores germinating again and recolonization, so you get relapsing disease. One of the most effective ways for treating Clostridium difficile infection has turned out to be fecal transfers, okay, or fecal enemas. Um, and that is been shown to have almost uh, a really, really high success rate, so above 80%, okay? Um, one of the more interesting things as well is that you can't just transfer any fecal um, inoculum. Uh, it looks like when they do this, what they'll try and do is find a, a relation, so a sibling or so on, to somebody who's genetically similar to you. Um, again, the theory being that somebody who's genetically similar to you might have bacteria, or are more likely to have bacteria that can effectively colonize your gut. This is a fecal inoculum. It's undefined, okay? So, yes, we're seeing this effect, likely due to the bacteria, but it's difficult to standardize this and to use it as a, a, as a treatment. But we do know when we get down to the, role, to the level of the individual bacterium that we can see that there are bacteria there that have, in this case, um, very potent anti-inflammatory activities. So, for example, in this um, paper here, looking at a mouse model of colitis, they were able to show that introducing live bacterium was able to uh, alleviate inflammation, but also transferring culture supernatant from that bacterium was also able uh, to alleviate colitis. So, using the bacterium as a probiotic, or alternatively, using the bacterium as a source of bioactives uh, and potentially a new generation of biotherapeutics. So, that's kind of setting up my stall. And what I want to do now a little bit is generally chat about how do we go about recovering bacteria from that core microbiota. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we're doing with humans, but also some of the uh, animal work, and really with um, uh, lab animal-based models of disease. So... Imagine this iceberg as representing your gut microbiota. This top fraction here, that little bit peeking above the water, is all that we really know about the gut microbiota on the basis of culture-dependent work. Okay? So being able to go into the microbiota and then recover 
and grow in the lab on agar plates or in um, uh, tubes these key bacteria. The vast majority of the microbiota that we know is there is unrepresented by cultured isolates and has never, to our knowledge, been recovered under laboratory conditions. How do we know it's there? Well, all bacteria have a marker gene, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, uh, and we can use primers basically that will amplify um, from DNA recovered from the community, amplify that gene, and then we can sequence it and work out the phylogeny and the diversity associated with the sample. So we can see then what that discrepancy is between what we're growing in the lab and what we can actually detect in the community. And this community is incredibly diverse. As we get down to the, so from the phylum level, and there's only a limited number of phyla in the gut, as we get down to the species and strain level, at the species level we've got hundreds of individual species. At the strain level we've probably got thousands of individual strains in our guts. How can we begin to look at that? Well, the approach that we've generally taken has been to recover um, a, a microbial sample, so be it a fecal sample, a mucosal sample, generate a microbial enrichment from, uh, from that, and then take what is essentially a culture-dependent approach, whereby we recover individual bacteria on a plate, and in many cases, uh, sequence their genomes to work out what's in there, and what are they doing? So this can be on the basis of genome gazing, so looking at the genomes and trying to predict what they might do. Uh, but beyond that, once you've got the isolate, you can actually do some phenotypic tests, so grow them up and subject, subject them to various growth conditions. Alternatively, we can take a culture-independent approach or a, a metagenomic approach. So if what we would do here, for example, is recover genomic DNA, so metagenomic DNA that is just agnostic really of what's in the community. We take that microbial enrichment or a fecal sample and we recover DNA without really worrying about what's in there. We can take that DNA and then sequence it and then try and assemble it into various fractions. With the improvement in DNA sequencing technologies, we're at a point now where we can basically reconstitute whole genomes independently of having to recover that bacterium. But in many cases, what we can do at a minimum is um, assemble very, very long contigs and then bin them into groups and say, well, this looks like, for example, this is Bacteroides vulgatus, this is Facilibacterium prausnitzii. And looking at that, we can begin to make some assessments as to what they might actually be doing in the community. But for us to kind of uh, inform our uh, targeting of bacteria, because as I mentioned, if we go up to the strain level, we're talking thousands of strain variations between individuals, where, how do we assess a starting point? One thing that we actually did with colleagues at um, QIMR was to look at the biogeography of the microbiota from the cecum all the way to the sigmoid colon. And what we see using uh, microarray technology as, as it was at the time is that there is a specific biogeography. So as you move from the cecum, you see an abundance of streptococcus, which decrease in abundance as you move, move towards the sigmoid colon but you begin to see uh, an abundance of proteobacteria here which decrease in abundance as you move backwards. So there is a specific biogeography along the gastrointestinal tract. Does that matter? Well, yes, it does. We know that, for example, ulcerative colitis is characterized by disease at the distal end, uh, at the sigmoid colon and distal colon, um, colorectal cancer here. Um, Crohn's disease can be anywhere along, but in many cases in the cecum and the ileocecal. Uh, junction here. So we might be seeing the impact of specific niches on disease. One of the other things we can do is we can, for example, begin to build some interaction networks between these bacteria. So for example, are there certain bacteria that inhibit the growth of other ones or are there certain bacteria that promote the growth of other bacteria? Um, so as an example, when you take a prebiotic, in many cases you don't know if that's promoting the growth of your target bacterium in a direct or indirect manner. It may be feeding it directly, but it may be feeding it indirectly. Another bacterium may be breaking down that prebiotic first of all, and the breakdown products are then stimulating the growth of your bacterium of interest. And by generating these types of interaction networks, we can begin to um, use that to inform our recovery of key bacteria. So 
I mentioned before that we're seeing differences in the inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease gut and the um, healthy gut. We see using uh, microarray uh, technology, as I mentioned, that we see the abundance uh, or a decrease in the abundance of key bacteria. So, for example, Facili bacterium, some of the ruminococci and new bacteria, and an increase in proteobacteria and enterococci. These studies are basically a snapshot in time. Okay, so we don't really know what was happening before, what's happening afterwards. Okay, but some of the more recent studies that we've been involved with has been looking at these changes to the microbiota in a longitudinal manner. So here we basically have Crohn's disease subject um, at surgery as compared to uh, healthy subjects. So it turns out that on the basis of colonoscopy, these subjects here had active disease and these subjects here were in remission. We were able to harvest um, biopsy samples and what we were able to see is that the Crohn's disease subjects that are in remission, their microbial profile is beginning to overlap those that uh, are healthy. And this is explaining 57, so up towards 60% of the variance in the microbiota as compared to Crohn's disease subjects who have active disease. Following them six months later, what we begin to see is that the subjects who are in remission um, are also beginning to overlap still healthy people, but people who have recurrent disease are beginning to migrate away as well. So we are seeing disease relevant changes to the microbiota and we can use these to uh, in somewhat uh, predict the, the onset of disease or disease state. So what are those key changes? Well as I mentioned Facili bacterium, as I mentioned earlier on, a key anti-inflammatory is much decreased in the um, uh, Crohn's disease gut, and also the ulcerative colitis gut. But we also see reductions in Ruminococcus bromii, one of the uh, key degraders of fiber, uh, Eubacterium, Dorea, Clostridium leptum, and all of these are members of the Firmicutes, cluster uh, 4 or 14, um, and also Bacteroides vulgatus is much reduced. Um, but it's quite an interesting bacterium, and I'll talk about it later on. But we also see, for example, increases in bacteria, for example, the Enterococci and Proteobacteria. Uh, so bacteria that would be with generally classed as being um, uh, not obligate anaerobes, but fastidious anaerobes. So they can grow in the presence of oxygen. And one thing that we do know about Crohn's disease subjects is that there is increased oxygen tension in the gut. So this may be providing an opportunistic or a niche for these bacteria to proliferate, uh, which then affects our disease state. So using those studies, we were able to um, refine how we were going to um, target various bacteria. So ones that we identified as being important to recover was, for example, Tericibacter sanguinis, which was identified as a core gut bacterium in the mouse, um, also shown to be affected by host genotype. So the host genotype is directly selecting for the abundance of that bacterium in the mouse. It's also present in the human gut. We also decided to look at Bacteroides vulgatus. This is a very abundant bacterium in the uh, healthy human gut, but also quite an interesting bacterium in that it's been associated in some cases with having anti-inflammatory properties, in some other cases with having pro-inflammatory properties. And we also decided to recover some enterococci. Um, why the enterococci? Well, enterococci have gained, I suppose, a lot of notoriety of, of recent, in the recent past as being um, opportunistic pathogens, um, very serious path pathogens at that, but we do find them in the gut as well. Um, they're used, for example, in the um, cheese making industry and the food industry. They're even used as probiotics. But we did see that in the Crohn's disease gut that these were increased in abundance, and we do see some interesting immunomodulatory um, or, uh, variations here across different strains. So we thought it would be good to recover enterococcus from the healthy human gut, and then, uh, if necessary, later on, to look at it in the context of strains that we might recover from the inflammatory bowel disease gut. I mentioned Tericibacter. Um, this is a bacterium that is, in mice, had been shown to be, um, it's abundance controlled by host genotype. Um, there was a very interesting paper that came out around the time that we were uh, trying to target this bacterium. And what they basically had were uh, two mouse colonies, one that had a conventional microbiota, so fully diverse, and one then that had a restricted microbiota. 
when they looked at the immune phenotypes of these bacteria, they saw um, that they were characterized by discrete differences. So amongst the uh, CD8 positive T cells and also marginal zone B cells and invariant natural killer T cells. Um, they hypothesized that this was related to the gut microbiota. And as they looked and looked for those associations, what they were able to find that the abundance of these immune cells correlated with the abundance of Tericibacter, mucosally associated Tericibacter in the colon. Looking at that, what they're able to show then is by knocking out, um, using a CD8 knockout or using a, an antibody targeting CD8, they could also vary the abundance of, of, um, these, uh, of this bacterium. What they hypothesized at the time was that this bacterium was capable of invading um, some marginal zone B cells or invariant natural killer T cells and that these were then being targeted by the uh, uh, cytolytic CD8 cells. When we recovered the genome, one of the things that we were able to identify very early on were the presence of internal lens. So um, typically found in listeria, which is an intracellular pathogen. Uh, and interestingly, in, interestingly, again, what we identified was internal in A, which is the uh, internal that you typically find in listeria that are uh, capable of uh, gastrointestinal inflammation. What else did we identify? Well, consistent with its uh, detection in the mucosal compartment, we also identified a range of uh, proteins that likely mediated adherence to whole structural factors, so collagen, fibrinogen, and mucin. We also identified, um, although the bacterium was originally described as being a strict anaerobe, um, an elaborate system that allows it to deal with um, oxygen tension, um, so hydrogen peroxide and oxygen radicals. And we also saw that it was capable of um, forming uh, or potentially capable of forming spores. We were subsequently able to show that it does indeed form spores, although again, the original description of this bacterium said that it was a non-spore former. Um, we also identified um, a ferrous iron uptake system, which again is very, very important for intracellular pathogens. Um, and we also identified a, a capsule, which you tend to find with a lot of bacteria that, that interact with the immune system. Looking at it, and we tried to predict what genes might be involved um, for necessary for colonization and persistence, or trying to predict the highly expressed genes. And we identified that all of the proteins that we identified that bind to whole structure of factors were, factors were predicted to be highly expressed, as was the ferrous uptake system, genes involved in spore formation and capsule formation. Um, we also identified alien genes, so genes that were likely transferred or subject to horizontal transfer. Uh, and we found these really not in the core capsule formation unit, but in the sugar moieties. And again, that's not too surprising. And we subsequently uh, published this work. The other approach that we've taken um, has been to use metagenomic approaches or the next, DNA, next generation DNA sequencing approaches to try and recover um, or to try and produce genome sequence for bacteria that we cannot grow in the lab. So in this situation, we were able to generate an enrichment culture of three, or three microbes. So Bacteroides, a Clostridium, and also an Archaean. Uh, so a triculture. Try as we might, we couldn't recover the Archaean as an axenic isolate. But what we were able to do was to use that microbial enrichment and then by DNA sequencing, actually close that entire genome. So sequence that entire genome. It turns out afterwards that this bacterium, uh, we were actually able to test this in the triculture, uh, feeds on trimethylamines uh, and, and, and choline. And we know that these metabolites are um, high levels of them, so produced by other gut bacteria, have been associated with uh, cardiovascular disease. And this could be an example of a, an interesting uh, archaean or uh, archaebiotic, um, so a, a microbe that you could use to reduce the levels of these metabolites in the gut. Another way we could do this is having the genome information, can we use that to try and recover bacteria? Yes, you can. And what we were able to do um, with some of the work that we did with the Tamar Wallaby was to um, take some of the sequence data that we had and begin to assemble it into bins. And we found in this case that they assembled into two major groups, so WG2 and WG1. And using the WG1 sequence, we were able to reconstitute uh, quite an amount of that genome. And looking at that genome, we were able to make some predictions as to what that bacterium was likely to need to grow. Um, <coughs> using that, we were able to uh, 
develop a medium in the lab and subsequently recover that bacterium as an axonic isolate. Um, and this bacterium also turned out to be quite interesting because um, uh, we felt that it was, or we feel that it's implicated in the observation that tamar wallabies produce um, less methane uh, as compared to ruminants when they feed on the same substrate. Okay, three examples there of how we might go about recovering bacteria. But is it enough to recover one? So, for example, there are, uh, if you look through the genome sequences, you'll see that for many bacteria there is one isolate. In many cases, that could be because that was a particularly diff difficult bacterium to isolate, and you're lucky to have one anyway. In many other cases, I think, or at least initially when this work was started, people were happy to, let's get one, sequence the genome, and that's that one done. Let's move on to the next one. But what are we missing by doing that? Are we capturing the genetic uh, potential of that bacterium by having one isolate? Well, an interesting bacterium, uh, as I mentioned again, Bacteroides vulgatus, um, when we recovered our uh, PC510 strain, there was one other uh, genome available at the time, and that was that of the type strain, um, which was uh, completely sequenced and assembled into one chromosome. Um, now we're in a position where there are seven genome sequences available all up, and there are a number of other ones, uh, at least up to 30 more, that are currently being sequenced, um, but are, that have not yet been released. When we begin to look at the pan genome, um, the pan genome is basically the totality of genes that defines Bacteroides vulgatus, okay? When we look at the pan genome, uh, what we see is that there is a, a core number of genes that are shared amongst all bacteria. But if we look beyond that, what we see as well is that there are very strain-specific variations. So this can be up to 500 megabases, or we've estimated to be at least 10% of the gene content, so 400 genes per strain um, is unique to that isolate. As I mentioned, this is based on um, seven recovered isolates. Um, but we can take this, and we can begin to model, um, well, what is likely to be the genetic diversity. As we do that, we begin to see that as we get to our seven strains, we're up to 9,000 genes. Now, bear in mind that any one individual strain has around 4,000 genes. Those 4,000 genes comprise a, a core genome of around um, 2,500 genes that are found across all of the strains, and then a number of other genes that may or may not be present in that isolate, but all up, it should add up to around 4,000. Using this, we can extrapolate this out, and we see that as we get to 1,000 genomes, this is still trending, up, trending upwards quite significantly. So we're up to 160,000 genes almost uh, at 1,000 genomes. So defining Bacteroides vulgatus on the basis of a single isolate is um, likely to be significantly, or is significantly underestimating the, the uh, potential of that bacterium. As we begin to kind of just look, look out here in terms of new genes, at 1,000, we're still having around 80 new genes, so around 2% of the genome um, will have genes that are not present in any, other, uh, any of the other genomes. Now, this is extrapolating. It's quite a big extrapolation to go from 7 uh, to 1,000. But the nice thing about this model is, so for example, when those next 30 genomes become available, we can begin to add this in here and refine the model. But on this basis, at least, this strongly suggests to us that it's not enough to get one or two or three. Um, we need to be develop, uh, producing genome sequences for a lot more of these gut microbes. So there's quite a, an extent of gene repertoire for Bacteroides vulgatus, but within that 4,000 genes that any one strain might have, how does that af affect its, um, its uh, functional potential? As I mentioned, one of the interesting things about Bacteroides vulgatus is that it's a core bacterium found at high levels in the uh, healthy human gut. Um, but while key strains are associated with uh, anti-inflammatory effects, at least a number of other strains have been uh, identified as having pro-inflammatory effects, um, or at least in, in mass models. What we were able to do, or what we decided to look at, uh, was using an ulcerative colitis model. So Bacteroides vulgatus has been identified as a potential initiator or driver of um, ulcerative colitis. And we do find that a high abundance in the UC gut of some subjects. 
we decided to very simply in the lab look at the impact of those environments on growth of that bacterium. So we were able to take a base medium, so brain heart infusion medium, supplemented with regular lab water, but then also fecal water is recovered from healthy human subjects and fecal water is recovered from uh, ulcerative colitis subjects. And what we see is that the specific growth rate of the bacteria, it's not significantly different. It's capable of growing w well under both conditions. You might expect that that would lead to similar patterns of gene expression. Nothing could be further from the truth. And we see that at least 20% of the genome, or all the genes in that genome, are differentially expressed. Um, with key genes being turned on under the UC condition and other genes being uh, expressed only in the uh, healthy gut. When you break that down, what we see is that in the ulcerative colitis, um, in that fraction of genes that's expressed, we see genes there that are involved in maximizing energy production, detoxification of uh, oxygen, or, uh, oxygen radicals, so oxidative stress, and also genes that are involved in <coughs> adhering to the host. And these are genes that we would expect, or we know from other work, are expressed in the UC gut. In the healthy gut, we see that those genes are not turned on. There's a lot more expression of outer membrane receptors um, that are turned on in the UC gut. One of the interesting things about that is this correlates with what we know about um, other bacteroides where you have a host IgA response and that the bacterium responds by down-regulating expression of those genes because otherwise it ends up coated with antibody. Uh, and those genes are turned off here. And we also see that there's a lot more environmental sensing and so on here. Um, so quite discrete differences in gene expression but capable of growing effectively under both conditions. Okay, how does that relate to the host? and um, host inflammation and so on. To answer that, we looked at the type strain, so the 8482 strain and our own PC510 strain, and we used a very, very simple assay uh, with colleagues, with our colleagues at INRA, who have developed um, a cell line um, which has an NF-kappa-B reporter. It's an NF-kappa-B reporter assay. And what we see is that um, for the 510 strain, as compared to just the blank medium, there's no expression in early exponential, mid-exponential, but suddenly there is an early stationary phase, but not late stationary phase in terms of activation of NF-kappa B. We see that the type strain in comparison uh, has a different profile of, of NF-kappa B activation with no activation in the earlier time points and only activation here at the latter time point. So then linking back to a functional attribute, okay, where we're seeing different strain characteristics uh, in terms of being able to uh, activate NF-kappa B. And again, I think further highlighting the fact that one strain is not enough to really begin to get a handle on what these bacteria are doing, uh, you need to have multiple isolates. Again, we've been able to do something similar with some of our F Facili bacterium prasnitzii isolates. So again, in case you think that Bacteroides vulgatus is uh, an outlier, Looking at Facili bacterium, so a cluster 4 bacterium um, from the Clostridia, so quite distantly related to Bacteroides vulgatus, we see a similar trend in terms of its pan genome. It's got a vast pan genome and it trends very strongly upwards, like what we're seeing here. So even within that group, um, it looks like there's quite a lot of genetic variability. Um, and we also have some uh, evidence as well, is that that relates back as well to the uh, production or the anti-inflammatory properties of that bacterium. So it might not be enough to say, you've got Facili bacterium, you're okay. It could depend <coughs> on the strains that you've got, and the same is true for Bacteroides vulgatus. So as we begin to try and define the healthy microbiome and try and come up with a new generation of probiotics, we probably need to sample more deeply and assess more broadly the functional capacity of these bacteria. I want to talk a little bit now. So a lot of what I've described there has been uh, work that was done here um, or initiated at least at CSIRO and some of the genomic work and stuff that we've, that we've done recently. But I want to talk about some of the work that we're um, beginning to get underway now and um, that we're terming um, tentatively at this stage anyway, the Australian Healthy Microbiome Project. So what is it that defines health and how does that relate then to uh, disease?
So this is led by um, Mark Morrison, so many of you may know Mark, but Mark is the Australian representative to the International Human Microbiome Consortium. Um, so he has been the, the driver, he was the driver here at CSIRO for our initial work here, uh, and he is the, as I mentioned, the lead representative there, so he is the Australian coordinator. Um, so he will be heading this up, uh, and I'll be uh, working as chief scientist, so really having a key role in terms of our recovery, identification recovery of select isolates, and then our characterization. So how, what are we specifically looking at here? Well, we see this as having three major aspects. One, looking at the human microbiome itself, so the, the healthy human microbiome, so within healthy individuals and then linking that across then to a number of other disease states. Um, we already have um, done a lot, of, a lot of work in this area. So for our, um, from our perspective, this is really a continuation of that work. What is new, though, is trying to link the animal microbiome in here, and specifically I'm talking about lab animals here. So laboratory models of human diseases, so be they obesity, inflammatory diseases. We know that there are quite a number of bacteria um, at the species level at least that are shared between humans and animals. Um, and we think that what we can discover here is going to be very informative for us in terms of being able to work out what's happening here. At least in the anim with animals and animal models, we can take more of a reductionist approach um, we strongly believe that while it's important to be able to recover axenic isolates in the lab and be able to grow them, we do need to look at them in the context of the host uh, and the host response. What we want to avoid is generating a stamp collection, okay, that we recover um, a range of isolates and act like the ATCC, put it in the freezer and forget about it. We want to also um, take a functional approach and as a member of the Diamantina Institute based at the Translational Research Centre, we also want to play a key role in translating that work in the lab to the bedside, if I can put it that way, or to, um, to something that's of use to the, to the general public. So be that maintaining good health or helping people who don't have good health to regain that. So what we're doing at the moment, and we've already started this, we're working with a number of clinicians and colleagues to um, recover fecal and mucosal samples from healthy individuals as well as subjects that have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, type 2 diabetes um, and obesity and to try and generate um, a biobank of isolates. How is this important? Well, although I mentioned that the core bacteria are less abundant in many cases across these disease states, they are there. Okay. And one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves out is, well, how are they different to what's in the healthy gut? Are there strain differences that maybe explain that disease risk? Okay? So we need to be able to recover, for example, facility bacterium from these types of samples and compare them to facility bacterium that we might recover from the healthy gut. Again, looking at some of the work that we have underway with colleagues, we're looking at um, healthy mice as a baseline but also looking at models of inflammatory bowel disease, so in our case specifically ulcerative colitis, but also reactive arthritis and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Uh, so we're looking at a very simple process, receipt and processing, identification and analysis, so knowing exactly what isolate we have, biobanking that, but also making that available to other researchers so that we can, there's too much there for one group to do, um, but act as a repository, you know, at least working with colleagues to produce these isolates and then to make that available for other researchers where we can begin to try and translate that into practical research outcomes. I want to touch, just finish up with, with, with this. Um, I think this is something that we're very, very excited about here and I think it um, gives our group uh, a somewhat unique capability that we, well, unique certainly in Australia, but we think also uh, from what we can see and in having had discussions with international colleagues um, that is relatively unique internationally. One of the problems that we have at the moment is that although we, we can recover axenic isolates in the lab and we can produce uh, metagenomic sequence data, we're normally stuck or we experience at that point a sudden deceler deceleration in our ability to try and translate that into practical outcomes. So for example, 
we can produce a lot of genomic sequence, um, identify a broad range of genes, but actually assigning conclusively functional um, or functionalities to those genes is difficult. Similarly, with many of the axonic isotopes that we can recover, we see from some of the assays that we can do, so be they animal assays, uh, cell culture-based assays, we see that they have interesting properties, so anti-inflammatory properties as an example. But although we have the isolate, although we have the genome sequence, we don't have the ability or we haven't been able to in many cases actually work out what genes, are, are, what genes underpin that anti-inflammatory activity um, and can we identify them? Would that be a way for us to use the gut microbiota as a source of new bioactives? To address this, we have sought and we've developed a way of recovering genetically tractable uh, isolates from the human gut using bacterial conjugation. So what we effectively do is take an E. coli donor with the conjugate of plasmid and we can actually take a microbial enrichment, mix it with the E. coli donor and when we do that we can recover um, uh, in the anaerobic chamber we can recover a diverse array of bacteria that have managed to pick up the plasmid from E. coli and to stably maintain that. Why is that important? It's important for a number of uh, three main reasons. One, we know that once we have this transconjugant here, we know when we identify it, what it is. Okay, so we can assign it to a group. The other thing we know is we know that that bacterium is transformable and we know the mechanism by which we can transform it. In this case, conjugation. The other thing we know is we have the genetic basis to develop the tools to begin to characterize that bacterium. So we have an origin of replication that works in that bacterium. We've got a resistance marker that works in, ba in that bacterium. And that, from any st uh, standpoint, is the beginnings of a mechanism to begin to characterize these bacteria. Why do we need to do this? Not a lot in terms of a vector. We need an E. coli origin of replication. We need a resistance marker, an origin of transfer, and we're looking at RP4-based uh, conjugation here, and a variable origin of replication. For good measure, we've also added a multiple cloning site, site to standardize the vector. The way we've built this, it's, it's, a very, it's a modular vector, so we can swap out any of these individual domains. If you're using an erythromycin resistance marker, great. Find that that doesn't work, well, you can swap it for chloramphenicol. You can swap these. So we've had a, a goal initially to try and recover the gram positives, so members of the Firmicutes, because they're quite unrepresented in terms of the culture collections. They've got interesting activities, and we really don't have a handle on how we can begin to work with them genetically. But we can swap out all these modules as we see fit. Does it work? Well, it actually works very effectively, or at least um, with some of the experiments that we've done to date. So using this approach, we've been able to recover um, a broad array uh, of bacteria. So from cluster fours, so bacteria affiliated to the um, facility bacteria, um, cluster 14s as well, and again, a very broad spread here. And we see within just this group here, the cluster four and 14, that what we're recovering are bacteria that other groups have reported in the literature as being immunomodulatory. Okay, they don't know what underpins those activity, but they have the isolate. What we have is the isolate, and we have a way of beginning to work with it genetically. Now what we need to do is work out if they have similar properties. And other groups as well. It's also turned out to be quite an effective way of counter-selecting certain groups. So for example, I've mentioned that the Bacteroides, uh, or the Bacteroidetes are quite a, uh, an abundant fraction of that community. But by using origins of replication that should only work in firm acuities and a resistance marker, we can counter-select those bacteria very, very effectively. So in all of our work to date, using metaparental mating, we haven't recovered one Bacteroides. So this is a very effective way for us of generating an enrichment culture as well. This is important um, for another reason, and that's because when you try and do um, these types of isolations, very often you find that your cultures are very often overrun by what we would um, generously call weeds. So enterococci, E. coli, bacteria that are capable of growing very, very quickly and beginning to dominate any enrichment culture that you may have. Again, by being quite selective with the resistance markers, 
and the origins of replication, we can counter-select all of those. Are there really transconjugants? Well, using PCR-based assays, we've been able to detect um, the plasmid um, in, again, a broad array of bacteria here. So uh, Oscillobacter, Facilibacterium, some of the cluster 14s. Some of the ones that we recovered are really quite new to science. So they haven't been recovered before, um, or at least they're new genre, new families of bacteria, or representatives of those. Um, that's one thing. Is it a stable plasmid? Well, we've also been able to go back to those bacteria, grow them up, and produce um, DNA, transform it, and then recover that DNA as well. And it looks like it's quite stable. We do see some deletions. So it looks like the bacterium is being accepted by the host, methylated by the host, and when we retransform that DNA back into E. coli, the E. coli now recognizes it as foreign and begins to chew that up. So that again tells us that the um, recipients are accepting that DNA. So are we there yet? Um, I think we're certainly a lot longer along the road uh, than we were a few years ago. Um, and I think, you know, with some of the culture dependent and independent work, I think if you take the totality of it, I think what it's highlighting for us is the importance of sampling deeply, assessing broadly. Um, but once you've got that, we've got the basis then to really begin to define what is that healthy microbiome and how is it impacting our health, okay? How is it keeping us healthy uh, and how can we productively manipulate it? So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. and. Thank you.